Welcome to Slated for Tomorrow. Hey everyone, I'm James R. Shiri. Sandy Sharma. Sandy, who do we have here today? Ambika. Ambika, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Do you want to introduce yourself? My name is Ambika Singh. I am the Chief Boss Lady at Armoire. I like that title. <laughs> Snap fingers, yes, yeah. queen, yes, queen. Um, I have been running this company for six years and I'm very excited to tell you guys about it. Awesome. Can you go into a little bit about like what this company does and then I think we can go right into your passion. Yeah, so, so what what do we do? We create we created the dream closet for women. And so what that means is that women can rent infinite variety from us and they don't have to own it. The idea that I'm really passionate about that you're alluding to is the idea of ownership. Why do we need to own so many things? The idea of ownership is actually super important to humans. If you think about evolution and our history, it separated us from man and beast. We learned that if we built things and then we owned them, we could use them. And the certain things really helped us prop ourselves up above other beasts, other other humans. Um, they were important. They had utility and they also projected status. Is it just utility and status or is there more? There's probably more. Okay. But do, you have a, do you have a recommendation? No, or? I'm just wondering. Like, it's just, Where did this come from, though, this idea? Because you said a passion about like ownership. Did that start at a young age? Like, where did you, where did the light bulb, yeah, where did the light bulb go off? So it's interesting. You, you mentioned also being perhaps very precious about your things. You may have even used the word hoarder. Oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 I did it in a facetious way. I'm not actually a hoarder. Setting the bar straight. I'm an organized person, okay? Just have a big, very big closet. He's an organized hoarder, but keep yeah, going. I mean, a hoarder has <laughs> a negative connotation because yeah. you're taking it all the way over there. But another I'm a way collector. Saying, yes, collector. <laughs> precious about your things. You, you place value on them. I would say I'm very much the same way. The problem with that over time is if you're precious about more and more things, you suddenly have more and more stuff. Yeah. And one of the ways that we project our success another one of your um, mm -hmm. very pointed questions, is that we buy ourselves things and we buy ourselves, other, we buy other people things and this collection of possessions signals to others that we have utility in our things. We can do stuff. I can drive here. I can live in my big house. I have a boat. Also, it signals that I'm carrying the Louis Vuitton bag. I'm wearing the Reese dress. Um, and so I'm projecting some amount of value through my thing. All of that is great in a world where we have infinite capacity from our planet to continue to produce things and to throw them away um, and for them to sort of like persist somewhere. Which we don't. Which we don't. Yeah. <laughs> we very much don't. And perhaps this is the first generation where we've really hit a place where we can have this discussion in a, in a real way where it's like, are we actually accumulating more stuff than our planet can Handle, yeah. Because, yeah, in, in just one generation ago, it was, like, very common for people to share things, to hand them down, to have them persist across generations. Those things had real value. And so we didn't have a feasibility kind of, like, um, barrier. And now uh -huh. um, we really can accumulate infinite things, particularly in certain demographics of wealth and access. Is it also some level of insecurity that drives us to do it? I mean, it, it, deep, it may not be deep-rooted, but it's like, hey, there's something called comfort food. There's retail therapy. Those words are used for that reason, right? So what is it? You deserve it. You earned it. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. <laughs> what did you do after X, Y, and Z milestone? Your, I, I had a baby. What did your husband get you? What did you buy yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't need a man. I buy myself flowers. This idea of us commemorating the things that we achieve with things is so deeply ingrained. You need the validation. You need the endorsement. Well, you know, there was a crazy stat that uh, you brought up earlier, which was, and I want to call this out because you're talking about pe people collecting things and then it just becomes, you forget about it. We have that in a trivia. This is crazy stat. I don't even know what we used to say trivia, but it's like... Uh, of all the clothes in your closet, you said... Um, 82%. As in a study that was done in 2018, the average American leaves 82% of their clothing untouched. Every counter. And I am totally guilty of that. Um, I have all these jackets. My mom, for lack of a better word, used to call me a jacket whore. Because I would just... 
I liked jackets and I would buy all these different ones. I was like, well, I have a rain jacket. That's a thick one. But then I have a rain jacket. That's a light one. And then I have, you know, like a leather jacket and that's heavy or light. (laughs) And to your credit, you clearly care about your things, which is why you've held on to them. So it's not that you are dismissive of the value of the things. But in fact, that also has its own perpetuating problems that it has a memory for you. Your Mm. mom gave it to you. Maybe you wore it in some special place. And suddenly we are weighted down by these things that instead of us passing them on to our kids as utility, we are passing them on as trash um, and they're going to have to deal with them. There is one article clothing that went from my grandfather down to my father to me and it's these cowboy boots. Now, that's the cool thing about leather. If you treat it well, you waterproof it, you it lasts. So I have a pair of cowboy boots that are 50 years old, which is and everyone looks at. Because you don't, you can't buy this brand anymore. So when it's emotional value and things like that, I get it. But I think you're talking about the middle of the bell curve. Yeah. Correct. And most of us are just exactly. not using it, collecting it, holding it. And if I have 300 different events in the year that I need to commemorate, suddenly the value of my cowboy boots, which like that sounds yeah. like a once in a lifetime possession. I now have any once in a lifetime possessions. Do you think social media also totally impacted the desire because people don't want to be seen wearing the same article of clothing all the time because then because your point it goes to back to a sign of well yep right and so like you go to these met gal like or even i think the met gal is a perfect example where all these people like clearly are doing like all these most extravagant outfits they will never wear again right yeah well it's not just that i think even even in every layer of society that problem does exist though with social media it's even worse because they're taking pictures posting them and they're like oh you're not even keeping up with the times yeah Exactly. Regardless of whatever you're affording as your brand choice, it's still a problem. And the storytelling aspect of that item that you're telling on social media has now been told. So even with your beautiful cowboy boots, how many times can you tell that story? Probably like only if I go to a concert. Let's rewind though. You got to this point, but I think James started to ask you that, tell us a little bit about your career because you've been at Microsoft, done a tech thing, you've done, and how did you finally end up here? What, what, what inspired I this? I <laughs> It was an amazing place to grow up. Were you always interested in fashion or how did you get to that journey? I'm a homegrown Seattle girl. Um, I went to high school in Kirkland. I know I'm, I'm now a, oh, a red Costco? Costco? Worked at Costco. Did you really? Yes. Okay. I, I was the bookkeeper for the eye doctor in oh. the Kirkland Costco. <laughs> oh. Nice. So was that your first? I started out there. And, but that what's not that's not fashion at all, though. That is not fashion at all, but it is very good values that I learned. Costco is an amazing company that I would argue thinks about fewer, better things. Yeah. You think about that journey around the Costco. One of the things that I, as a consumer, think about is that Costco only has three kinds of pickles, and they're probably the three best pickles. And so I can pick one and feel pretty good about it. Fewer, better things. So that sounds like that had a pivotal in- influence on your view of, of the world where just like too many choices is a bad thing potentially. So I like that. So then from there, where did you go? So from there, um, I worked at my dad's company um, as an intern, a marketing intern, learned a ton about um, marketing, was very interested in like the science of how people think about their things. How do we make buying decisions? Um, I was super fortunate to go to an incredible university on the East Coast. I went to Dartmouth. And I um, did something. So I wrote a senior thesis there about microfinance. Um, so then what after that? Then the only connection between there and my next step was the word micro. And I went to Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a good connection. <laughs> that's a Keep going. All right. Um, I had the coolest job at Microsoft. What did you do? At the time, uh, Microsoft was running the world's largest student technology competition. And this, is, this was. Is the- that the Imagine Cup? That just finished recently. Yeah, just it. Amazing. Yeah. I'm very happy it's to hear really it has persisted. Cool. Yeah. You put yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I was on that team. It was four people at the time at, at the headquarters, and I was like, oh, there's such a cool journey for you. Such a cool job. I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Like, these kids wow. are the best and the brightest. I wish companies did more of that. That is like how we talk, because the public school systems aren't set up for that, and they will never be. And I think this is like, as you talk about sustainability, whether from fashion, but like sustainability from an education standpoint, I think that as companies, it's just smart investing in the future generation and incentivizing them at like that early age, 15, 14, yep. whatever, because eventually they will go for a full-time job. Don't wait for them to go post-college to feel like, I don't know what I maybe think I want to go here. Start early and invest. 
Anyway, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I mean, yes, all of that. Um, so then what was next? And so then I got uh, proper career advice and decided I should take my career onto a straight path to management at Microsoft and went to Windows and things like were oh, quite no. as shiny. <laughs> you know, I went from like my day to day job with like these incredible kids building these incredible things to like, I think I was probably like number 702 on the marketing team trying to ship Windows 7, which was like a bit of a. So All right. I learned a lot. Um, but um, Rich Barton was starting a travel company at the time. And I happened, well, starting another travel company at the time. And I happened to get, <laughs> if he listens to this, he'll laugh. He said, uh, at the time, I'm probably like 25 or something. Do you really want to be 40 and sitting in a cubicle at Microsoft? Oh. And I was like, <laughs> oh. now that I am almost 40, I'm like, that's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> With all the stock you would have gotten at that point if you made it to 40? So I packed up and went to this incredible travel company that they started that was housed just down the road from here. Um, so another embarrassing fact of how I got lost. I want to stop you right there because I think a lot of us are given advice like that at that age, mm -hmm. but not act upon it. Why did you act upon it? Like, that's, that's a good question because, you know, this, a lot of our listeners are early career, mid career, and they've just fixed that path and they're not deviating from it and they just justify it to themselves every day. It's a very good question. What triggered the, why did you pull the parachute cord? What did it? So it's really interesting that you guys ask about this because I'm actually next week talking about, um, uh, the t the title is called um, How to Chase Your Dreams Without Taking the Leap. Oh my God, that's such an attractive title. In my book, um, with like when I look back, I don't ever remember pulling a ripcord or jumping off a cliff or diving off an abyss. And I'm still waiting for the clouds part and the vision to come through. Okay, okay. Come at some point. Okay, then what, but what is me, it? for me, it's yeah. like... Um, I think enterprise sales at Aditi taught me a lot about this. Patty, who you should have on the podcast yep, again. Yep, yep. The ball goes forward every day, Bika. That's that's the goal. That's it. The, bo the ball goes forward. Keep so, hustling. Yeah. So you do a little bit more today than you could do yesterday. You have this idea of like who you want to be. Even with, with going to the travel company, it wasn't like I quit like the next moment. Yeah. Like we talked about it. I learned something about travel. I thought about, you know, what should I do next? But I think a lot of ideas like die in that paralysis state of like should i could i no you can't do the thing that you want to do yeah. in the end state tomorrow you can only push the ball forward towards the end state and so i think if we look at it through a gendered lens women have again like less of um opportunity and more risk built into their profile so it makes it even harder for them to make those decisions. And do you see that changing? I mean, yes and no. Like one, as their opportunities, or I should say our opportunity set increases, I think rationally we do have more options. So one is like on women to make sure that we are readjusting. But the stigmas and the social, yeah, that still remains. If we go back to like biological state for a second, my understanding is that psychology wise, women are more risk intolerant like, like when they talk about on a resume and they see a job application. Actually, I've heard this stat. Go ahead, tell it. A woman might be like nine out of the 10 qualifications for this, this position, but because she didn't do one of them, she doesn't apply. A guy is like two out of the 10. And will still apply. And, and, and it's just that. And I think it goes back to, again, look at the microfinancing thing. And I don't think it's a negative, actually, because if we were all just risk intolerant, then you'd have what happens to some of these things like SVB banking situations and whatnot. And and there's a fun, amazing stat that just came out about women CEOs for SAP are like the top performing CEOs because because they're thinking about long term strategy while also hiring maybe the right people. And I and I I, I, I will say this that I think that's my most influential managers. This is the fun part that took a chance on me in my career happened to be two out of the three were women. I did, and they, and I loved it because they even said to me is that James, you may not have the skill set yet, but we can teach that. You had the aptitude to learn. And I think that's the cooler part. Whereas, but back to some guys, if you're a guy manager, be like, nope, they're not 100% there. And I don't want to spend time and energy to train it. And I think it's a really cool, like 
component as a female leader. Like, what are your thoughts on that insight? So I think that they're like everything that we live in the grays. Um, well, politician answered there. <laughs> So I think women are rational actors. And, and the negative part is exactly like what we talked about from a microfinance perspective. They are making a rational decision to be more risk averse because they have less available opportunities. Yeah. So if a dude fails, he may have 16 other jobs that he can apply to. Whereas like the the um, the breaks that it's taken for Sally to get there are yeah. the all she, she knows <laughs> that she doesn't have 15 opportunities behind her. So the structural change that we have to make is to make sure that women have the same amount of available opportunities. And so sometimes you have to give them more to start stabilizing. Because a lot of people oppose that, but I think that's needed in every demographic that has been underserved. You have to do it. That's the structural change around. But I do, on the inside, women on the, for themselves have to make changes in terms of how they think about decisions. And that's a little bit of like what I um, want to kind of like help to try to convey. Because back to your question about like why... One of the the things I think is you got to break the problem down into push the ball forward things, and then you got to teach your, teach yourself to take what what I call micro risk. Oh, and teach yourself that a micro risk like. wearing this weird dress, or ordering a weird thing, or talking to you two on a weird afternoon. The worst thing that can happen is going to happen, and then you'll realize it wasn't that bad. No, <laughs> taking micro risk and then realizing. It, it, that what did you say that the worst thing that could happen that could happen could happen but then it's over and it's not that bad i uh, i have my own version of that which is you know like the wayne gretzky's component is uh you miss 100 percent of shots you don't take I, I i love also the one which is the answer is always no if you don't ask totally like that is a life philosophy that i try to subscribe to but we're still trying to get to the pivotal yes of what triggered yes the thought behind amor there was no moment of the of the clouds parting. So it just moving the ball forward. It was a moving ball forward, and I'll tell you. So um, after uh, Microsoft, I I did work at this travel room, place, yeah. Which I think w- a, a lesson that happened there. So um, it was called Travel Post, became Trover, persisted for a while. Um, it uh, went overnight from being twenty one people to seven, and I was one of those who got cut overnight <laughs> in <laughs> this like very kind of like in at 26 or whatever, kind of like devastating yeah. way. Must have been. Recruited my best friend to be the product manager. I was the marketing I thought we were on yeah. some kind of trajectory. Yeah, we're working for these like incredible humans we all super respect, the great proposition. Stuff happens. Yep. That was the worst thing in the moment, right? Of like, I had taken this great stable job I had at Microsoft that I was super proud of. I had made this risky decision, go to this startup and... 11 months in, I had no job. And I learned. Okay. okay. And then? It was wasn't it? so bad. I walked away with the friends. My my product manager and I went on this spirit quest and drove down Highway 1. Okay. You actually did that. We actually did I that. I love that. Perfect. That's amazing. So I, I was very fortunate to land on my feet. I, I went back to Microsoft, contracted for a while. And then I got a phone call from someone who probably has been in here in some format. Madrona was starting a little dog company called Rover. Well, Greg Goddesman was sitting right here. No way. So Greg called me. <laughs> um, right. So Greg had pitched the idea at Startup Weekend. Um, Phil, who is still the tech lead there, was the only employee. He was like, um, I heard this because bouncing around, back of Microsoft, sulking. <laughs> um, so I became the second employee at Rover. And uh, I stood in dog parks for a year. And you did not. Convinced people that they should put their dog on the internet, which at the time, and this is also informative to my future journey, people thought was insane. Like, people literally in the dog park looked at me like I was You're crazy. Satan. Yeah. They were like, anything can happen on the internet. You think yeah. I would put my dog on the internet? Do and I was I, like, well. I want to ask you, so you took this role at Rover. What were they, what was the job description? Was there a job description? It, um, kind of. And did you make the job? It's a marketplace. You need to have dogs. You need no, to no, have no, dogs. No, 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 right. no, no, no. No, I get that. But what but, are the job descriptions? But she, she was a contractor. And so like for people, this is what I... The yeah, what are the opportunities like? Yeah, I just want to, I want to help them understand like, you know, because you, you were employee number two. Yeah. So like, what did life look like for you at that stage? And we'll eventually get to the... Good point. Yeah. So um, life was very much exactly what you said. So Phil's going to write the code, um, who is still my great friend. We're having dinner on Saturday. Um, He lived with my brother for years. Like all the things that happen in small companies. 
Um, and uh, Phil's going to write the code and you're going to make the company work. So, okay. That was it. What was it? The, the business person in the code. Yeah. <clears throat> there was no job description. Yeah, there wasn't. Do whatever has to be done. <laughs> um, but we were incubated in the Madrona office day three or something. I'm very committed that we should live our values. So we must bring dogs to work. We don't care that it's on the 47th floor in like the most expensive real estate. The dog gets diarrhea within the first like few hours. And like poops all over, like right outside the partner's office. And I'm like, oh, God, on. good business decisions. Yeah. <laughs> the partners, the VCs at uh, Madrona are like, what did we do? Because there was no concept of incubators at that time. We were the first like incubated company. They definitely were like, what the? So me and Phil are like taking. So you, you started employee number two. How long were you on that journey before then you're like, I'm going to do my own thing? So is that what's next? From there, I actually went to sell for Patty. Um, I spent uh, just under a few years at Rover, loved it. It was a moving behemoth Yeah. Um, that uh, had lessons to be learned and not all the lessons for me, I think, oh, at the okay. time. So um, I was very junior and trying to like figure out my way. And what I specifically remember saying when I left was like, I've spent now the last like four, three or four years selling things that don't exist. Um, and I'm ready to sell something. Something tangible. <laughs> yeah. And it, and Patty gave me a shot. So this is Patty. Um, great guy. Pradeep Rutnam um, was running Aditi Technologies at the time. Uh, I really want Adidas. Technology. Aditi. 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 It's, okay. a, it's a technology solutions company. True sales job. Um, and uh, he gave me a real shot. Um, and so I became an enterprise sales guy. I nice. was the youngest person on the team, the only woman. Um, and they gave me a real shot and I got, I did well. Surprising to, I think to everybody. This was technically then like your first enterprise sales role, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and I loved it. I spent, I think, and in, in the end, like nearly three years, I had all these like, cool. So were you there till the sale or did you? No. You left just through the sale, and uh, so they sold the company to um, uh, Harman Kardon. What it got sold, yeah, many times and, after yeah, it. yeah, exactly. Um, and I went to business school, which after that, yes. So Patty tried to talk me out of it, and that, another great line that I'll never forget. It, um, he said, "Women tend to over credential themselves. Yes. If you want to do something, just do it. I'll give you like sabbatical. I'll help." I love that though, as a mentor. But you'd wanted to go. I really wanted to and go. And you enjoyed it. I loved it. By the way, I want to take that as a pause and say this. So this has happened to quite a few people who I have known, who I felt were already doing quite well. And they don't need to go get that MBA. I felt that. Yeah. Two of them actually went ahead and loved it so much after that, I stopped giving that advice. Because it is uh, actually, you have to realize it for yourself. And I feel if you go late to MBA, it actually works much better for you because yeah. you experience all of that stuff in real life. Yeah. Now yeah. you go there and I'm like, oh, now I know what the hell I should have done in that situation. So it's actually... In terms of like things that I, on dark days, that I lean back on to encourage you to continue to give that advice, I, I have so much respect for him. The fact that he thought I was like ready... To, ready to do it? Yes. I, rem I remind myself of that. Patty thought you were good like before you went to business <laughs> So keep... <laughs> Giving people that advice because they'll right. they'll lean yeah. back on it. So you were there at the sale. I was there at the sale. Very exciting. Then, then I guess did that financially set you up to the place where then you could do your own thing comfortably or how did that play out? Is this now where you're going to your company? So I went to business school that with this like very loose thesis of the fact that I wanted to start a company. And this is where like... Dartmouth again? I went to Sloan. I went to MIT. Oh, I am. <laughs> so you finished at MIT. Yeah. So, so I went there with this like very loose thesis and I got there and it was an incredible place. I'm learning about all these different careers I think was one of the coolest things I had this like um worry that I'd come from Seattle and I just ended up in tech because like that's what everyone does and I was like what if I should have been a journalist um, <laughs> but, but somehow the journalist motif was like the furthest away for me of like but what you I picked that. Was. <laughs> all right um so the first summer comes along and I don't have a company or an idea and so I'm like now what so like everybody else, I um, become a management consultant because that was like the easiest. Yep. Yeah. She did it. Where did you go? Prove my success, Delight. you know, like fight it out and like show that I'm the smartest. <laughs> um, so I worked at, at for BCG in Seattle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Name drop it over here. 
with somebody that represent BCG here. <laughs> yeah, I know. True, true, true. It's a great office. I would love to introduce you to more people. All right. Um, I learned an incredible amount in the summer and I made great friends. A lot of them are still, you know, like involved. So that's fascinating. You, would you say that you were great as a salesperson? I think I am a good salesperson. And, but not a good consultant. Correct. Why do you think that? Yeah, that's a good that's a good one. I'd love to hear your answer on that. Yeah, I think being a consultant is um, a particular and very difficult skill of translating somebody else's thing. To make in, it your own? It, yeah. Well, making to solve it, it understandable to other people. So like your client generally has an idea of what they're trying to convey, but for whatever reason, they have not put it on a paper. Crystallize it, yeah. Yeah, so your job is to like take that vision and put it on a paper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is not my particular skill. <laughs> I'm the one that needs the help on the okay. Pizza. <laughs> okay. So I've got ideas. Yeah. Um, and I think one of my particular skills is being sort of, um, I have an idea that is somewhat brave um, in lots of ways. And um, I have the will to kind of like bring it to life. I do not necessarily have all the pieces required from an execution perspective to like. But then you know you need a team and you sit down to yourself with the right people. Right. And so trying to be part of that execution team was a really good learning experience for me because it gave me a lot of respect for what it takes to take these. You know, they they say this and I do think it's true. Like ideas are great. They're also a dime a dozen. Like putting together that real execution plan that has all the check marks and the cells in the spreadsheet and the, all I'll that ask stuff. ask you a, a question which is related to team building, right? And it could be in a consulting project or in your own company. There is something around specific skills. Yes. But there's also something around personalities and interests and strengths and also eye psychology, right? Because there's multiple ways to assess yourself. Yes. Have you ever explored that? Do you know what that is? Do you think that's important? In terms of like, do I think the the makeup, makeup of the team? Makeup of the team. How do you build team synergy and team culture? Like what? what? It's so important. And certainly I am still on a learning journey on that. So I tried all sorts of things. Okay. Elderly care. Um, there, there's like a big ep- epidemic it's in huge. America of like huge. loneliness and stuff. And so I thought about like at the, at this time it sounded more revolutionary, but like AI kind of stuff to like bring people um, closer together when they're digitally when they're actually far away. But the one that I kept coming back to, and you you mentioned design thinking. One of the great things about business school is you're surrounded by a lot of smart people who have a lot of time on their hands. So we did a lot of like brainstorming, lots of post its. Yes. I interviewed all these women. And one of the things that Rover had certainly informed me of is a, like, I am very passionate about working on something that impacts people's lives intimately. The cool thing about Rover was like, we really and continue Chained. to change yeah. the way that people live because their dogs are their children and putting them in a safe place when they are traveling, like really changed the way people um, felt. Yeah. And so I wanted it to be that intimate and that close. So I kept coming back to the closet. And one of the reasons is when you talk to women about we walk through their home with them, the closet occupies a lot of brain space. It means so much to them. They've invested time yeah. and money and it's an enabler and a tra- detractor. It makes them feel bad about themselves. There's all these adages of the skinny pants and all this stuff. And yet it seems to not be working for anybody. So it, I was really kind of like struck by that. Your customer discovery was pretty overwhelming, right? It, it was. was. Like, yeah. And I could generate incredible, like it felt like infinite amounts of discussion from customers about like how- A lot of passion it, around so it. So much passion around it. And that that felt very reminiscent of the Rover problem. So it's interesting and, and we kind of, I this is the term I've coined and I love it. It's just, it's the karma of thinking and feeling, right? Everything we do. Every brand, every interaction, how you make them feel and think is what draws affinity or takes it away. Yeah. But this whole space itself is about thinking and feeling, right? It's all about who you are, how you feel when you dress a certain way and what people are thinking about you. Yes. This is very emotional, right? And the word and, armor uh-huh. and armoire have yeah. the same root. And that, oh. that I mean, I didn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. How did you come up with that title for the company? Well, that, so that that was definitely an inspiration. But you know, somewhere in the in the evolution of language, those two things got kind of like stuck together from. Them. So so we have as a society kind of like thought about those things similarly in the past. And you can point to you know war paint and like make up this idea that we suit up and go out. Um, ready into, for battle. Yeah, game face on. Exactly. Game face on. There's so many of these things. That, like, and so that the the name in that way, like really spoke to me in terms of like what we were trying to do. 
Nice. So when did it start? And how how is it doing? So second year, we I come back. It goes through every class at Sloan. All of my friends take it into like finance and ops and whatever. Cool. And this idea like bounces around. And so um, the big break was that we got into MIT's accelerator. So to your point about like how did we finance it? Um, that was hugely important because we they pay they gave us a little bit of money. What was it, like fifty thousand, hundred thousand? It, it actually very smartly they meted it out by week. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you had to meet milestones for to unlock more money. Nine mile labs, we did the same. Yeah. You haven't done we it knew how much you yet, get, Sandy, but you but keep we'll getting see. it. Yeah. <laughs> There's Still some wait. ideas that are just not fundable. Wow. You know, that's what Mark Cuban said about Uber. And then what happened? All right. Uh, Uber's still out for jury. He's doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So they meted it out by week. And um, it was basically, you know, like ramen dollars and enough for us to buy clothes was very important sustainable clothes too it's sustainable clothes too there you go um we went through that summer and uh i step out onto the mit stage thinking i'm definitely god's gift to mankind um has anyone seen me and i raised no money in boston yeah <laughs> and i'm like wait one minute so what was the reason why do you think it happened it it is and continues to be a very difficult idea which doesn't scare me because i am not uh, the reason I think this opportunity is so exciting is because on the adoption curve, we are on this, I guess no one can see me doing this, but we are on the uh, growing side of the adoption curve. And so once the thing tips, it's a less exciting place for a person like me to be. I want to be on the upswing, but but the the uh, downside of that is that uh, back to being uh, saying that I wanted to sell something real, I am back to selling something that many people which think is, is which not is real. fine. Yeah. By the way, people will see you seeing this because we do have video. However, regardless, what you write about the curve, if when you did your initial discovery, what was the product market fit that you were after? Because that was expanded. There's a vision behind it. There's other, you know, other benefits and reasons to, you know buy from you and work with you but what was it initially what was the basic mvp or whatever you want to call yeah, it yeah that's a, it's a great question and I, and I remember this like very clearly so the, the the kind of like two um data points or sort of like mvp circular circular points where um the most exciting day in the life of the dress is the first day so you know if we, we held out of people's like physical items and we looked what when did you love this thing the most or when first day first day yeah first day okay so we've got a problem because everyone only likes their clothes on the first day. And then how do you feel about this like asset you've created? Guilty. Guilty was the most repeated word after talking to 500 women. That's pretty incredible though. Yes. Yeah, so, but this already existed. Like my sister's closet and some of these other things that already started. Plato's yeah. closet is another one, right? Are you familiar with so them? Plato's car- closet is thrift. Um, okay. And, and I think actually thrift and re- rental are very closely related. If you take the... Yeah, if you take the um for the for the people who lived through the um this revolution, we used to have servers that sat in people's offices and then we said, "Let me manage that service for you. I will tell you what to buy. I will take care of it. I'll send the guy out to make sure it's all stood up and all that stuff." And we went That's to the we Seattle do. clouds. Right, Craig. That's what we do. We say, "Give me that closet and let me maintain it for you." I'll met it out to you as you need it. I'll curate it. I will make sure that I have the best stuff for you. That's my like clean and laundered and dry cleaned and correct. ready and available for you to. Yeah, but just wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's hold on, a managed on. service. So I could give you my closet, and then you would rent out my items. So we don't do peer to peer today. We own all of the items. So the, so so where is the business today? But and, and then maybe that will help me kind of like explain a little bit. So. So there's there's some amount of product market fit around the, the fact that, yes, you can give me constant newness. I don't have to own it, so I'm not adding to this guilty problem. Day one, I, guilt goes down, right? D- yeah, day one, guilt goes down. Have many day down. ones. Uh, yeah, you're always having day ones with your closet, and you're yeah. not feeling guilty about it. Okay. Um, And then we evolved from there. So I moved the company back to Seattle. I managed to raise money from mostly from people who know me personally. Yeah. Sheila Galati wrote me a first check one of my mentors from microsoft barely thank you sheila where we are today we are six years in having survived a pandemic which we can talk about yeah holy crap um it's a multi-million dollar business we ship to every state in the union we've had tens of thousands of customers we own hundreds of thousands of items and we move this stuff around every day so do you have so it's a warehouse you have a warehouse of people's clothing right 
our own. So we their own, own clothing. They own everything. They said no peer to peer, right? So, yeah. Back to your original question. The problem with peer to peer, and you can just see this if you look at the publicly listed companies, the margin on single SKU, no one has quite figured it out yet. Because for us to touch the clothing as humans, the labor cost of that to then tag it, take a photo of it, and put it up. There's just and and part of that is because we don't realize the real cost of either producing things or throwing them away. Good point, because when you think about even fashion stuff you buy, right? The cost of production and transport is one part, but the cost of marketing and retailing is huge. One of the questions I want to ask you is, what are some of the challenges that you face when you started your own fashion company? And I think you kind of alluded to just the issue of the the founder's dilemma is people are, it's like clarity of vision. And even if you have a clarity of vision, people may not want to invest in you. And so how did you overcome those challenges? Like, I, you know, you you had this MBA from MIT. You've got a great rap sheet. After getting told no in Boston, why didn't you just go take your corporate job? Like, why did you still stick with this and come to Seattle and, and keep fighting for that? So I think a couple of things were on my side. One, I had a bunch of co-founders who, um, back to your kind of like question about team, this is why I think I'm still on an evolution of that journey. Mm-hmm. I think the the needs of that team really change. And I have been very fortunate at every stage of the journey, I think, to have the, to have the right people. That's yeah. awesome. And, and those people have completely changed. And so that's why I think it's like very stage specific. So in the earliest days, I quite literally, we got into the MIT accelerator and I called my best friend from Microsoft who like had, had nothing to do with this thing. And I was basically like, I need a favor. Yeah. Like, can you come to Boston for the summer? And she stayed with me for a year and a half, basically on that's awesome love, <laughs> like love at the end of the day. <laughs> and she write code for you. What what, what was it? Gr- brilliant marketer, um, super creative. Uh, our first data scientist, completely different. Um, he had worked at Citrix and was very inspired by the problem of um, basically uh, overproduction and and could we be smarter about recommending people and then use our power as kind of a major purchaser to make sure that reduce uh, uh, sort of like um, overproduction in the supply chain. He sat behind me in the, at the accelerator working on some completely different submarine company, something, something over the summer. So they were different kinds of people and they were there for different reasons. And I was super fortunate to be able to. And they're rotated out now is what you also said. Yeah, most. um of that early team, uh, the one who sticks around, and, and she wasn't even on the very earliest team, um, worked at Aditi with me, was my roommate at one point, runs our um, 50-person warehouse, who all of the major 3PLs, 3PLs are like pack and ship people, have walked through and yeah. tried to say, oh, we could definitely take your business. They come walk through one time, and they're like, never we mind, can't. keep your business. So it's sometimes like the... People who are really close to you are also the best people to be running um, certain functions. But like, I also just hired a new CTO who was Bill Gates's first technical fellow, who was a woman who, um, we, you know, we we had never met, and her credentials are off the charts. And I'm very fortunate that at this stage, she can come in and um, help us right to the next how, stage. How have you created the culture and the chemistry? with people from such diverse backgrounds and, you know, how, how does it, how does that work? How did you keep the friendships after you, people left? Good point too. Great question. That's an important question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So on that one, I do think this is one of the most incredible parts of Armoire is that like, especially in tech, we talk a lot about diversity and I think we end up sort of like reducing diversity, frankly, to like things that are observable. What color are we? What are our sexual preferences? Yeah. The thing is that the Armour business demands that we have diversity of skills and thought. Surprise, like what comes along with that is people who look different from each other. But there is a deep respect. And this part, I, I think we have fostered, me personally and the leadership team, everybody has a hand in getting the box out today. I like that. The, it's so true, right? Like the website has to Not stand Not just up. physically, it's like different ways. Different ways. But like we've all got to, we've all got to touch it somehow. Um, and so now I was wondering if you rotate people too, because sometimes that's very refreshing as well. Yeah. Hey, you do the website and you show me the tracking. Why don't you just go down to the ship room? Yes. <laughs> and physically so we do some of that. It has become less po- possible. Yeah, well, as you become as bigger now as you grow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
but it, it is true. It always I, I actually just did a um a stint in the QC department. QC is one of the reasons why the three PLs won't take it. Yep. We smell the clothes, every single one. We check for hair. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Obviously, it needs to be clean. Yeah. Well, and this is after it's been dry. Oh, cleaned. even if it's clean, sometimes you can have a stray or the hair just stays. Yeah. So QC is a very um, intense job that only the rental companies do with the kind of fine tooth comb that we do. Okay. And then, what about the? And so I think the the, the cohesion comes from respect, and I, and I do think that's like something that we consider a core value and we reiterate it and it is obvious to people um because when we do fall down we all fall down and it usually has come from a bunch of places that have worked together to make us fall down and you call it out and you use them as learning moments and totally totally back to his question though which was hey when some people parted how do you still maintain friendships yeah i mean i think that i have tried um with some success uh to make sure that i'm very transparent because I don't, I don't think it's it's um it's not business first or friendship first. It's like these are two separate things. <laughs> they are two two different. Like you know, like even thinking about um if if you kind of like extrapolate that into this for me the idea of like work life balance is um a misnomer. Yeah, my work and my life is like very integrated. So my friends and my company are very integrated, and so on the on the days where you know things aren't going well in the same way in a friendship you would say hey man like this this didn't work for me hey man like this didn't work for me but as long as i think you are fair with people along the way and transparent in the same way that you are with your friendships those persist like beyond how do you differentiate yourself and what is your purpose what do you guys stand for so uh, on the first question our our long vision is that people own less things and we will enable that uh, ownership model over time. Like the the sort of like particular expertise that we're building both on the um, and, and the in three buckets that I think the third one is somewhat. Um, I didn't realize the third one existed. We're building the tech that helps us move the stuff around. We're building the ops that helps us move the stuff around. And we're building the customer journey that helps people understand why they should own less stuff. And that's the third bucket that I didn't respect in the beginning. It is a radical change it is. to say, you know, we just, we riffed on it a little bit in the beginning, but like really for you to tell yourself, I just sold my company or I did this thing and I'm not going to buy anything. What are you going to do? <laughs> like, what, what are you supposed to do? And so that like rethinking, we are also on a journey of trying to understand for ourselves what that looks like and then communicate that with our customers because that's the long vision. It's an interesting question, though, because uh, I'm looking at this trivia sheet here. 34 billion pounds of textile waste a year. And that's just textiles. That's my point. Just textile. Okay. And then here's another one. I just want to throw these out because we may not get to get to them. But the other one, I don't know if you know, I'm going to ask you the question. Let's see if you know it. 62% of all clothing is made of synthetic fibers. Washing those synthetic fibers accounts for what percentage of microplastics in the ocean? Oh, I actually don't know, and that is a phenomenal statistic, and I will take that home with me. 35% of microplastics in the ocean come from just washing those. So That is uh, incredible. So look at what we're doing, right? But it's, uh, so the question you were asking about what would you do? So COVID, during COVID, at least my wife and I thought about this a lot. We generally don't buy too much anyway. Yeah. And we don't care about we don't want to be decently turned out. We don't care about brands and buying this and buying that. We do have some expensive things, but whether it was my watches or clothes and whether I had a shoe thing going on, I stopped buying those too. And all I did was I love classic rock. I just bought classic rock shirts and that's all I wear. Yeah. And then I don't want to buy anymore. But we all, as a family, decided to focus on experiences. And the experiences don't have to be damaging the planet. Sure. Or collecting stuff. Yes. So, so that's kind of what the way we found our joy. So it's that. That's it. I mean, it, it, there are ways. I guess there are alternatives, but it doesn't work for everybody. Right. I, I don't know. And and the silver lining for so we didn't talk about much about this, but the the so COVID was not pretty for our business because our um, specific kind of uh, wedge on acquiring new customers was that this was we were wardrobing the boss lady for work. So she was out there in the world, which for obvious reasons evaporated. What has been really interesting is that um, we are up 
from a net customer perspective 80% since the year started, which is well, by any standards. And, and, and what's driving that? I think there was a lot of rethink that happened in COVID because I can point to like smaller things. And like as an operator, I sort of like hate these like tipping point kind of like, blah, nobody knows what that means. But I sort of think we might be on a tipping point of people realizing. It's really important to that. Let me go one step further. Let me go one step further there. In regards to the 80% that you've increased, is there a certain type of garment that is most purchased in the sustainability rental component? Because I remember um, athleisure wear is like through the roof, Lululemon sales through the roof, you know, because it's become more acceptable and whatnot. And so I think COVID drove that too. It, it did. But, uh, and also, you know, the stimulus checks allowed people to buy a lot more, but you said you've grown 80%, right? Or, or uh, 80% more customers now. Is it, and because as we're trying to talk about the future of sustainability, like where is like your percentages of types of clothing styles for the women? Because you said it's currently female only. It's currently female only. We okay. will get, I mean, clearly our mandate to, in our view is a lot broader than that. It not only includes like all kinds of gender expressions, but also more things beyond just the closet. So what has changed from a inventory mix perspective? It's not as dramatic as you would expect. So one thing that I'll tell you that is so shocking is that okay. our cocktail dresses rented through COVID did not drop dramatically. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I think people wanted to like, they wanted to show up. They wanted to look good because they got sick and tired of wearing just like sweatpants every day. So, so, co so event type clothing is popular for y'all. Is that like the main articles or segment? So the, we kind of like think about the closet in in every day okay. is our bread and butter. Okay. Um, it is a subscription based product. So mo the people have said to us, please outsource back to our like managed service conversation. We They have outsourced their closet to us. So most people every day. Event stuff is about 20% of the closet and athleisure, which was at, at like less than five is now about 20. So it did it did kind of like. Um, make and a real in the everyday Ambika, how many average number of pieces of clothing would somebody rent a month I mean how many is it so um, the average number of take home pieces is six and most people are wearing those two to three times before they return them to it and there's a couple different models about how they can they can either be on an unlimited rental plan or they can get one box every month depending on like what works and for what do people person. prefer yeah it's yeah. about 50-50 wow so, so let me ask you that then because it's a rental model do y'all create um, construct or, or restrictions in the system so that people aren't just, cre you know, they're just renting everything from you. And the, again, the same problem is now these closets are bigger and bigger and bigger, but people are paying on a subscription model. Like, so do you yeah, say- How many can I get? I can't get a thousand. So you can, and that and that was something that we worried about on the unlimited model. Right. I mean, a thousand may be kind of tricky because you have to get a- package i mean you're the maximum you could do is you could get a package every business day of the month and a package could have how many um a package if you decided to pay up uh, it, uh, included in your unlimited subscription is six but you could pay up to up to 10 um but if we take the six and the 20 business days you could get 120 items from us every month how do people do that yeah because that sounds pretty pricey too so that's because i'm wondering like the equation how expensive is it though? And like, does it, does it add out? Because like, it's one thing to buy something and just wear through it. Like, yeah, what's the ROI for people? Yeah, in because like I buy, I'm, I'm willing to buy a diesel jean. Correct. I'd buy diesel because it's quality made. Yes. And so I've noticed that in some types of situations, the more I spend on my article of clothing, I get more use out of it. Which, so like for me, I will only, I, I actually cycle through two jeans until they get holes in them. And then I, you know, Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. But um, and, and it puts you in a big minority because the average American is wearing a single item of clothing seven times before it ends up in a landfill. What tech are you using to do more personalization recommendation? Is there some AI play here? Like, tell tell us a little bit about that. So there's a parallel kind of thesis here that I'm um very interested in. So choice, and you mentioned this at, in the early part of our conversation. This environment of infinite choice is very new if you think about Keep shopping on, yeah. even one generation ago we go yeah. to the stall yeah. the store there's a limited number of choices and we can make sense of it and we look at the apple and pick the best one or we listen to the retailer and we pick the best shirt 
Yeah. Infinite choice is a scary thing for humans and it ha- causes all sorts of like difficult fatigue, fatigue, anxiety. One of the most interesting um, studies is that you can pick the same jacket in a high choice environment and a low test environment and you hate the jacket after you buy it in the high choice environment because you have buyer's remorse. You worry that you pick the right thing. In the low choice environment, you're really happy with it. You think you've got Good the point. right thing. We are working um, on reducing choice in our environment. And so what that means is that there's there's an incredible b- book um, written by a Columbia Business School professor named Sheena I- Iyengar, who it's called The Art of Choosing. And it's basically there's two kind of like main things about essentially help people make fewer choices because that's a great way to make better choices. She even suggests that if the thing doesn't really matter to you, ask somebody else to make the decision for you. Outsource it. If the choice matters to you, figure out some categories that that you can understand and a limited number of choices. Her theory is that we can really only understand a maximum of seven options, plus or minus. Let me ask you this. Okay. Generative AI. Have you thought about how that'll help reduce choice fatigue and your business so one of the really exciting things about generative ai is it gives us the opportunity to limit down the choice set because we we are getting information in a way that the 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 user really finds um acceptable because i could have done this even in the before times in an endless form i can keep asking you to give me questions it could be an algorithm yeah yeah but apparently users don't want to sit there for 40 minutes and answer but generative AI gives us a different paradigm that allows us to be more reactive. And so our kind of like real life model is, this is the boutique down the street. How would she talk to you? She would say, what are you looking for today? It looks like you're wearing blue. Would you like something similar to that? This is clearly a conversation we can have through generative AI. Oh, you, I, you don't really seem to like that one. What is wrong with it? What could I change? Now we can present a different set of choice options. So I think that this um the infinite aisle that amazon has presented us has shown us an extreme version of shopping where they're really hoping that you have decided that what you're going to buy on somebody else's dime you've done your discovery elsewhere yeah, yeah, and someone yeah. else paid for that and you're coming to them to choose the low cost margin. that is true no no because you go do your retail reviews and you come back and buy it on amazon correct or it's a brand that you already know you know your size you know your color you just buy it correct i do just that but if it's a new choice, it's always failed. So how do you how do you make it better? You have some consultants now, fashion consultants. I mean, that's humans. Are you moving towards the generative AI? Is that the future? We are moving towards a paradigm that looks closer to that. The, the reason that we are best poised to step into that space is because we have two things on our side that most retailers do not have. One, because the items are rented and they stick around, we have an incredible bank of information about the item. And so to give, to put that like in, That's a fair statement, in yeah. stark parallel, we have more reviews on our clothes than Nike's women's business. Oh, hell yes. Period, end state. Like crazy, right? You think about the different like, scales of business, but that's because Nike and Nordstrom exit their items every six weeks. And they're not in your closet. They don't know what's happening. Exactly. And so I am shifting that paradigm, which is difficult. Come back to my customer, right? I've had to tell her not only should she not own things, she should also not own things that are only of the moment. Like the Zara, right? Like Zara did so well because it was an exclusivity, right? It goes back to your point like, oh, it's only going to be here for two weeks. Correct. But that is does not a sustainable business. It's a horrible business, right? Zara, H&M and whatnot. Let me ask you this. You ready? What are your thoughts on like these companies like the Burberries and whatnot where I, I think it, they would burn clothes for scarcity. Like, what are your thoughts on this from a sustainability practice? And let's even go into, tell me how you really feel about companies like the Madewells, the Lululemons who have these recycle back programs where you're, you know, an old product, you can turn it, receive a discount or free pair in return. Does that work? Is that like helpful in the sustainability journey or is it just like a nice to have, but doesn't really do crap? Um. So so on your first question, it Burberry's just... They're the ones that got caught. Yeah. Oh, well, lots of others do it, of course. Yeah. Everybody does it because there's just no way to get rid of the volume of waste. If you if you believe my thirty percent, thirty percent of the stuff that gets produced never experiences a transaction. It goes through all of the stages and, and never. And these are past Q where they were perfectly fine pieces. Perfectly fine, but 
you know, if you walk around the Nordstrom floor, all of that stuff's not going to sell. Where's it going to go? It'll go to the rack, then it'll go to Goodwill. You're right. You're right. That goes to the Nordstrom. Right? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, down the line. So we're overproducing in a phenomenal way. So that stuff's going to get burned at some stage. Okay, that's one. Then these like give back programs and whatnot. I think it's a great customer acquisition mechanism. It's like the Tom shoes thing where like you buy a pair of Toms, it goes. Well, Tom's a, a, a little different because okay. like, I mean, similar idea in, yeah, the, yeah. in that like you feel good about the fact that they're giving. But if you give Lulu back your pants, you need new pants. Yeah. <laughs> it's clever. Very clever. Right. OK. You're going to walk in and kind of do that. But tell me this. If these brands didn't exist. Yes. What would you have in your closet anyway? In, in your warehouse, I mean. So you do need them. They're part of your ecosystem. Oh, absolutely. Oh, there are like, there yeah, are great partners. No, because you're not producing, right? Yes, yes. Not so, today. So on a systemic level, what's your vision and where does this go? I mean, I, I think that the um, producing different kinds of apparel is an amazing thing. Like we, we didn't talk much about our customer, but the, I'm super passionate about outfitting the boss lady because she armors Who up. Who is the boss lady? Tell us. <laughs> Sitting here, right here, right now. It, I, are you the boss lady? I've heard of them. I've seen them on mugs. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> what is the boss lady? You probably have a few in your life. I do. I have a lot. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. Yeah, the, the boss lady is an amazing lady. She's holding up our family. She's holding up our community. She's holding up our workplaces. She has limited time, but manages to accomplish a lot of shit. Um, and she needs to suit up in the morning. And that means different things to different people. And so her having the appropriate armor that makes her feel her best is where I want this to go. And so apparel production is super important. And we're, we are thrilled to support local, women-owned, BIPOC-owned. There's a, a kind of like um, humorous way that we always uh, talk about, like especially women-owned brands. You'll notice they always have pockets in their clothes. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah, well, I... I love that that there was a thing that they invented most recently in dresses where they have pockets because it's well, functional. You know why they took them away? Well, in theory, all clothes had pockets at some point. But like, why did a silly woman need a pocket? She has a husband right, who's driving the car. She doesn't have a wallet. Armoire is on a mission to reinvent the way modern women dress. And we see that come through like through your service, which is a thing pretty freaking cool. Um, but on a larger scale and systematically, what do you think needs to change in the way we search, source, wear, and retire clothing? And then finally is what are the trends that you see shaping the future of fashion? Okay. I have two very, so on, the, on what needs to change systematically, we need to realize the true cost of producing and throwing away clothes. And the second one is- And then who's the we? Everyone. As a society. But then a lot of systemic change doesn't happen just by- groundswell in humans is there more that could be done like can companies government is there more i mean have you thought there about is that? more so so we um in seattle made a a move towards removing plastic bags and plastic straws hell yeah which i would argue especially on the straw side was more performative than it yeah, was it doesn't really do anything right if we started to charge people for the clothes that they were throwing in the garbage we might see very quick uh, change. My wife gives me so much grief if I go to the store yes. without my re the bag and yeah. I come back and she's like, I've always liked your wife. Yeah, but that's just awesome. But it's about making the point. It was Walmart did that because like how often did all those stupid paper thin Walmart plastic bags. Yeah, it's. I think it's the most to your point about like, yes, we, we can do all these performative things. Yeah, and, and you can do, create awareness and yeah. you can do some education and evangelism. But, but like even for the, for the step of like, if I had to, pay ten dollars to throw this dress away i might even try to give it to somebody yeah awesome or think twice about buying it in the first place i think on the production side it's more tricky but it but the it, similar ideas of like we are not realizing the full cost of production and that's mostly a by the way speaking of production i have to throw out one trivia which is awesome for the audience hear this you just buy a new t-shirt from zara h&m amazon doesn't matter and it's a single country source or region how many thousand miles do you think it traveled before it ended up in your closet. 100 miles, 3,000 miles, 10,000 miles, or 40,000 miles? 40. It's 40,000. How would you describe what the future of sustainable fashion looks like from where you sit today? Rent your clothes. Damn right. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. We usually give this opportunity to you know, 
plug anything and everything you've got going on, if there's events that people can go, where they can get more educated on, just how to be more thoughtful. What about purposes, um, philanthropy, anything else you want to talk about? I know you also give to Dress for Success. Are there other causes? Would you just want to promote those, please? Yeah. So um, w- w- one thing I think uh, to highlight is like, what are we doing inside our own walls? Um, there is a lot of promotion of um, female leadership, paying real wages. We are, I think, the only company running an apparel warehouse in the city of Seattle. So I I think a, a rich city involves all kinds of different jobs so that all kinds of different people can live here. And part of that is sustaining um, companies and wages uh, that can allow people to live in our beautiful city. So. Mm-hmm. Think about what we're doing in our four walls. This is a homegrown company and your dollars will support our employees. Um, We are super proud of the partnerships that we have outside of our four walls. So all of our clothes, um, and this is an important part about donation. We make an extra investment before we donate our clothes and we only donate some of them. Dress for Success is an incredible organization that takes um, women who are um, getting back on their feet and gives them a full service uh, resume production, job interview, um, help, and actual connection. And we come in with a wardrobe. And um, Because you got to, if you don't look good, you don't feel confident or everything, right? And so instead of us like dumping bales of clothes to them, we dry clean everything, we sort it, we make sure it fits with the sizes they're actually looking for and the types of clothes that they're actually looking for. So it's an incredible partnership. It helps us live our values. Any others? Um. That's the one that uh, comes to mind, either for you or the woman in your life. This is honestly a transformative way of enjoying your closet because you will go from feeling guilty about the stuff you have and uh, irritated that you don't have the thing that you want in the moment. Come to armoire.style, follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and you will see um, promo codes. Our price point starts at $79 for the month and goes up to $249 a month. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 